Well, we're going to complete our review of the epistles of Peter. And as we go into the Word of God, we always want to do it with prayer. So let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this privilege that you've extended to us. We thank you for the availability of your Word to each of us. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit. We do pray, Father, that through your Spirit, you would help us to apply these insights to our lives, that we each, as Peter encourages us, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, in whose name we commit this time and ourselves. Amen. Well, we're in 2 Peter chapter 3, and it's interesting that there are two books that are very, very parallel, 2 Peter and 2 Timothy. In both cases, they're the swan song of the author. Uh, this is when Peter wrote his second letter, he knew he was facing death. Paul, when he wrote his second letter to his protege, Timothy, he also knew that he was facing death. So there's, in that sense, a certain similarity. They're both swan songs of his heart. And so both epistles put up a warning sign of the apostasy that was, going, that was on the way at that time. Paul was warning Timothy of the apostasy that he should expect in the churches, and that's exactly what Peter is going to conclude here. And what's interesting, this is also a sign of our times. You know, everybody does these prophecy summaries about what's going on in the Middle East or this or that. One of the most conspicuous signs of our time is the apostasy of the church itself. How many pulpits in our own country fail to declare the redemption of Jesus Christ, His shed blood. They talk about a lot of other interesting things, but that seems to take a, a, it's number 11 on a list of 10 somehow. So they're both facing death. And it's interesting, they both speak in a joyful manner of their approaching deaths. It, uh, Paul knew the same, that his time of departure had come because he'd finished his course He'd been on the, what he seems to portray as the racetrack of life, and now was leaving it. He fought a good fight. He kept the faith. Those are all echoes, of course, of his epistles. A crown of righteousness was laid up for him. Paul was excited for me to part and be with Christ is far better, and so forth. And uh, you're going to find the same triumphant note here in uh, 2 Peter, as he also faces the prospect of death. Now, the major divisions of 2 Peter 3, three parts. His attitude toward the return of the Lord as a test of the apostates. Interesting yardstick. We're going to maybe discover some different perspectives from that passage. The agenda of God for the world is going to be laid out. You want to talk about global warming? We've got global warming laid out by Peter quite clearly. And then, of course, it closes with an admonition to all believers. If you're not a believer, don't worry about it. You can leave now if you like. But if you're a believer, there's some specific admonitions for you here. So let's just jump in. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. I now. And the word now, or already, implies that the interval between these two letters was not very long. We went through 1 Peter. 2 Peter followed fairly closely on the heels of that, it turns out. And I stir up your pure minds. The word in the Greek is actually um, means found pure when unfolded and examined in the sun's light, is what the term is really used. The word sincere is probably a better translation. I stir up your sincere minds by way of remembrance. Way of remembrance. Preparing to depart, Peter encourages them to keep hold of what you have, the Word of God. Keep that in remembrance. And by the way, you can find admonitions all through the Bible to memorize. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Scripture memory is something in which it, that, that can bear fruit. It can be overdone if that's all you're doing. Don't misunderstand me. But um, there is a value in Scripture memory. And that's one of the reasons so many of us tend to cling to the classical King James. Yes, there are some modern translations that render this or that a little clearer maybe, but they keep getting replaced by better modern translations. 
And I'm on the review board for the International Standard Version. It's in, and as it gets finished, it's going to be tremendous in many ways. But I still do my memory work in King James. Why? Because of its majesty? Yes. But also, I know it's going to be around 20 years from now. And so, that's a, a subtlety, perhaps. Remembrance. That's been a key theme in this letter, to add to your memory verses. Uh, that's that's a, a style, a tradition, a commitment that many people may, may, may not, uh, you know, they, they abandon it in our wor modern world. But it's a good idea to have a collection of verses that you can that you have command of that are in your heart. Second verse: That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Interesting how he puts himself: us the apostles. He teaches him that he, he includes himself with Paul. We're going to discover before this chapter is over that Peter is going to authenticate Paul in a very interesting way. And that's going to be, I think, important to us. You know, there are many people, many Christians get very enamored with the Old Testament and the Messianics, and they, they discover the Old Testament, and that's great. But as they do, they run the risk of starting to put themselves under the law. And you'll discover if you fellowship with the Messianic believers a lot, you'll discover they they tend to be a little uncomfortable with Paul. And uh, yeah, and uh, I think it's interesting. None of them are uncomfortable with Peter, and Peter authenticates Paul. So we'll see that as we get in further in his letter. Now Paul was committed to the uncircumcision, that is the Gentiles. Peter to the circumcision. They divided up their ministries. Clearly, Peter was called to the Jewish believers. And Paul, even though he had a heart for his countrymen, being Jewish, he realized he was called to the uncircumcision, to the Gentiles. That's one of the reasons that he doesn't sign his 14... He did 14 epistles. 13 of them he signed. There's one he did not sign because he knew if he signed it, it would foreclose much of his readers. They knew who wrote it, but he didn't sign it. And it's like an amicus brief in today's courts. There's a concept in our courts of law that you can be a friend of the court, amicus curiae, where you, you, you might have some knowledge or background that's useful to the court. You're not a party in interest to either of the disputants, but you can be a friend of the court by filing an amicus brief in which you provide something can be helpful uh, without taking you know, uh, the part of either side. And uh, that's sort of what the Epistle of Hebrews is, because... It's written to the Jewish believer, but he didn't dare sign it as an apostle because that would be super arrogation because Paul regarded the apostle to the Jews as Jesus himself, and he wouldn't step into those shoes. So as you study the epistle of the Hebrews, there's a lot you'll learn uh, about Paul by it. It's very interesting. But anyway, Paul is to the Gentiles, Peter to the Jews, and they both make that point in their letters. But Peter continues, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. When? In the last days. And so, has the last days started? Absolutely. We believe we're in the last days for many reasons, but one of the key reasons that we know we're in the last days is we have our horizon littered with scoffers, people who claim to be in the ministry that uh, are false teachers. And uh, so, and why are we surprised of that today? Both Paul and Peter hammered this in their letters. This very disparagement is a sign of our times, the fact that there are people in pulpits disparaging the Word of God. Scoffers. These were the apostates that dealt with in the previous chapter. We had a whole chapter, chapter 2 of Second Peter, was re-aimed at the scoffers. Well, he's bringing them up again here. And these are members of churches. We're not talking about, you know, the pagan extremists that are not believers, clearly. We're not talking about those. We're talking about people who masquerade as believers. They're members of churches. And uh, some of them are pastors. But according to this, they're walking after their own lusts. They're victims of heart trouble. The hearts are not in the right place. The hearts are in the world. The hearts are after growing their ministry. And uh, anyway, these scoffers are saying, where is the promise of His coming? In other words, they're disparaging this whole focus on the second coming. You hear a lot of pastors sort of 
express concern to their congregation. They're getting too wrapped up in prophecy, end times. And they dwell on the fact that, gee, there's many different theories about this or that and so on. They say, where is the promise of His coming? They just doubt the idea that uh, Jesus promised to return. And there's a lot said about it. There's over 1,800 references in the Bible to Him coming and ruling on the earth. But they're saying, where is the promise of His coming? And notice the premise that they attach to that skepticism of the second coming. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. How interesting it is that they continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. See, not only is the return of Christ questioned, even from pulpits, but what they advocate is uniformitism, a form of evolution. It's interesting that they link the skepticism about the second coming with their commitment to evolution. Evolution in the sense of, of all things continue, since they were. See, both thoughts, the second coming and the creation, imply that God intervenes in human history. And they like to take the view that God doesn't do that. Their concept of God excludes the idea that He actually intervenes in history. And so, he's, Peter's going to use examples where God has dramatically intervened in history as his rebuttal to this. So Peter's really raising the question here, is there really a God who intervenes in history? And that's the issue here. See, both the beginning, the creation, and the end are linked. Now what's interesting, we are the beneficiaries of 20th century science. And that 20th century science has made two disco several discoveries, one of which is that the universe is not infinite, it had a beginning. That's what leads to these conjectures called the Big Bang. They know it had a beginning, they call it a singularity. Prior to that there was nothing and then we have the creation. And uh, it's interesting, those same scientists will tell you that from thermodynamics they know not only did it have a beginning, it's going to have an ending. They call it the heat death. Because every uh, transfer of energy, matter and energy, involves some losses. There's no 100% efficiency. And some of that loss goes to the ambient. So as life goes on, it's like the whole universe is wound up and it's winding down. There's a point at which, see, every piece of work in the, in, in the universe is based on a temperature difference. And when that temperature difference results in some work, some of it's lost. So... The day comes where there is no temperature differences, where there's uniform, uniform uh, uh, thermodynamics, there, no more work can be done. So they call it, they, they know that the universe ultimately is heading for a heat death. And that's maybe billions and billions and billions of years or whatever in their minds, but still, it had a beginning and it has an end. That is the, the view of any informed scientist, quite apart from uh, the benefit we have from the Scripture. The Lord Himself, by the way, revealed that he would be coming for his own. In the upper room, John 14, he, he emphasizes that. And he is preparing a place for us. And we're going to meet him in the air, Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4. This is all basic stuff, but let's keep it in front of us here. And he then will set up his kingdom on the earth. It's interesting how that's so expressly laid out in the Old Testament and the New, and yet you'll find it largely absent in most Christian teachings. You find that uh, all the way through. Gabriel committed that to Mary when she, uh, he announced the birth of her child would sit on the throne of David. In the book of Acts, when he gets ready for resurrection, they ask him, are you going to set up the kingdom now? He says, not, you're not supposed to know the timing. Doesn't say he's not going to do it. He just quarreled that they, the, the timing is not their business. And the pivotal event of the book of Acts, in Acts 15, is the Council of Jerusalem, where James himself quotes Amos 9 from the Old Testament, all these things. So now Peter is going to cite the Old Testament with examples to prove that God does intervene in history. And that's the, that's the, he's going to cite rebuttals to that very premise. The first of that, first of the ones he alludes to, is a flood. Now the question that lurks here, by the way, I don't want to make a big thing of it, but I want you to be aware of the fact, there are some 
difference of opinion as to which flood we're talking about. Uh, we obviously can take the safe ground by assuming he's talking about the flood of Noah, because I think he is. But not necessarily. I was quite surprised to discover some very prominent Bible teachers suggest the possibility it's not the flood of Noah. It could be the original judgment in the so-called gap between Genesis, the first two verses of the book of Genesis. And I was quite surprised to find that J. Vernon McGee privately holds that view, that it probably is an allusion to the gap theory. I didn't even know he was a gap theorist because uh, the, uh, there are a lot of very good scholars that uh, you know, are a little uncomfortable with the gap theory. So the safe ground is to assume he's talking about the flood of Noah, Genesis 6 through 9. But let's go see what he says here. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. What's that referring to? Could be either one, by the way. Because we encounter the, the earth in the second verse of Genesis, but the earth had become. We'll get into that here in a minute. The willingly. Ignorance here, though, is a response to the will. And that's what Romans 1 teaches us that, you're, that uh, ignorance is willful. It's willful. And it's a decision. It's not a lack of information. And uh, it's important for us to understand that. If you have any doubts about that, I encourage you to read Romans chapter 1 very carefully. And if you, in, in the antediluvians, the people that were with Noah before the flood, they wanted God to depart. We get that insight from Job and elsewhere. And that's the way it is today. They really don't want God around, Okay. The pagan world would like to get the Christians out of their hair, and God is going to give them exactly what they want when the time comes, interestingly enough. But, uh, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. You know, Psalm 136.6 says, um, the sixth verse of that says, He stretched out the earth above the waters. That's interesting. Interesting phrase in the Psalms. Psalm 24 Verse 2, he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. We have a very, very different, uh, you know, uh, uh, cosmology here implied in the Scripture. But Peter goes on, verse 6 and 7, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Okay, the, the world that then was, he's dealing with here. And um, so this certainly could refer to the flood of Noah. It might refer to some other things. There was a universal flood in the time of Noah. Now, by the way, let me underscore that. The Bible clearly indicates that flood was worldwide. There are people who say, well, it was just a local flood. If that's true, God didn't keep his promise. If the flood of Noah was just a, a small region... God promised he would never do that again. Well, there's been lots of local floods, in regional floods. So if the flood of Noah was local, God didn't keep his promise. No, no, no. The flood of Noah was universal, and that's what God promised he would never do again. There are many scholars, and I tend to lean this way myself, that believe the flood of Noah was the second flood. <clears throat> there was a flood that we, are, we pick up the story in the second verse of Genesis. The gap theory. This will be old news for most of you, but just to put this in perspective, <coughs> there are some basic issues that hide behind this. When were the angels created? Long before the earth. We learned that from Job. When did Satan fall? He's an angel that fell. Very powerful. He's in charge of everyone. He fell. When? He was already fallen by Genesis 3. And so, is there a gap between the first two verses of Genesis? It seems to be suggested several places throughout the Bible, and it's our conjecture that that was a judgment that was associated with Satan's fall earlier than the second verse of Genesis. Let's take a look at what it says in the first few verses of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. No, no contest. If you understand that verse, every other verse in the Bible will yield to you. But, and, and then your King James says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved or brooded among the face of the, upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let light be. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. The evening and the morning were day one. Strange order. The evening, Erev and Boker, the evening and the morning were day one. But it's the second verse that causes some attention, because it reads in your King James, 
in the English, and the earth was without form and void. Well, when you get to Isaiah, God has a passage there, chapters 44 and 45, that are incredible. But in verse 18 of chapter 45, God says something very strange. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it, he created it, not in vain. Same word that's used in Genesis chapter 2. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. He created not in vain. The tohu, same word, without form, confused. You see, the way we have it in our Genesis thing, in the earth was without form and void and darkness is upon the face of the deep. The word was there turns out to be a transitive verb, a verb requiring action. And it, so, haya, it, it had be, it, it's in the past perfect form here, had become, and the earth had become. It was not that way originally, it had become without form and void. And it's the same verb that's used in Genesis 19 when Lot's wife became a pillar of salt. Same word. In other words, it's a, it's a verb of action. Okay. It became without form. And that's, of course, tohu vabohu. Uh, tohu, the same word that's used in Isaiah. And void, to, tohu vabohu. Now, the word and there is a vav, which is a conjunction. But it's interesting that that conjunction is adversative and is so rendered in both the Septuagint and also in the Latin Vulgate. It's adversative. In other words, it would, should be translated not and, but the earth. See, and there's an adversative aspect to it. And it's so used in a number of pa passages. That term also, by the way, often is used in the Hebrew to represent a significant time delay. An eight-year period in Exodus, a 38-year period in Deuteronomy, a seven-year period in First Chronicles, 58 years. The term and it's but, it implies a delay. But in any case, so this could be translated more properly, but the earth had become without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And if that's the case, then that sort of gives us a hint that something transpired between the first two verses. And uh, as we look through all of this, uh, we find those, those terms, uh, tohu vabohu, in several passages in Isaiah and also Jeremiah. We'll look at one in a little bit later. And darkness is upon the face of the deep, and that's Choshik. It's, an un, it's a word for an unnatural darkness. And the deep, of course, is to whom it is the, in the Greek, it's the abuso or the abyss. Apparently the home of demons and evil spirits and what have you. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. So here we have this idea that there was an interval, a substantial interval, between the first two verses is originally apparently suggested by Thomas Chalmers in 1814. And you can compare a number of scholars that have really gotten into this. Uh, George H. Pember, Earth's Earliest Ages, is a classic back in 1907. Donald Gray Barnhouse, a highly venerated conservative scholar, and his did a whole book called The Invisible War that I commend to you. Arthur Custance, Without Form and Void, he gets into this. These are the classic references uh, in the so-called gap theory. But if you look at Jeremiah, let's get back to the Word of God. In Jeremiah chapter 4, there's a little passage there that describes the earth in a way that's hard to fit into our knowledge of history. Jeremiah says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Oh, really? And the heavens, and they had no light. That sounds like what we're talking about, doesn't it? I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. And I beheld, and lo, there was no man. And all the birds of the heavens were fled. It was out, without form and void. And uh, again, that same term that we find in the, uh, uh, Genesis verse 2. But it continues, I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. And all the cities thereof were broken down, down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. And thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. I wonder why. Because there's more to come. And God was going to recreate it and give Adam uh, a role in his redemption. I do understand they've made some, there's some evidence of a pre-existent civilization even way earlier than Sodom and Gomorrah as they did down, no, but I haven't had all that confirmed, so I'll let it go. We'll go on here. Let's get back to Peter. Now, he could be referring to that as the first flood. It's possible. Uh, J. Vernon McGee leans that way, but he really presents it more in a safer way, so to speak. 
whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished in the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. You and I experience a creation that has had some adjustments to it. And let, setting aside the gap theory, let me get into that. The, the, the heavens and the earth, which are now, let's talk about this. We're in a second world that we're living in, subject to a form of global warming that's going to come up here in a minute. But as we study Genesis, you may recall that we made a map of entropy uh, throughout the from the beginning on. Entropy is randomness, and randomness is maximum at the bottom and minimum at the top. If you look at the bottom as chaos and the top as order or design, this is upside down from the way you might expect to see it. And we have Erev and Boker. The word Erev really meaning chaos, disorder. It later comes to mean evening because that's when things are hard to perceive in the evening. Boker is just the opposite. That's orderly, discernible. If it's not discernible, that's the evening. If it is discernible, that's morning. Those terms later come to mean evening and morning. But the original meaning may have been more generic. So we have Erev and Boker. We have an, an, a decrease in entropy as God starts to create. And the first thing, he, of course, he does is he creates light with its mysterious behavior. Then the second day, he, he, he goes on and he creates the, you know, the space itself is stretched out. And so we get to the, uh, to the third day, and that's when the, the uh, uh, sea and the dry land appear. Notice, by the way, the earth is present here all along, it isn't until the fourth day that we have the planets and the sun make their appearance. That, that shatters most people's perceptions here. And so we have the fourth day where we have the sun, the moon, and the stars. And then, of course, we get to the fifth day where we have the sea animals and the birds. And then we have the, finally the sixth day where we have the mammals and man created. And, uh, and then we get to this very strange day, the seventh day. In chapter 2 of Genesis, then thus the heavens and the earth were finished, all the host of them. On the seventh day God ended His work which He had made. He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made. God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because that in it He had rested from all His work which God created and made. And so we have the seventh day which is characterized by no Erev and Boker. There's no Erev and Boker on the seventh day. So I suggest that the Erev and Boker here had a meaning quite different than we think of it as marking a 24-hour day. Not that these weren't 24-hour days necessarily, but the point of Erev and Boker are dealing with incremental steps in the reduction of entropy. And the seventh day, there's no changes. There's nothing created. It's a day of rest. So it's, there is no Erev and Boker. And he ended. He ceased from the work. But we know there's some interval of time, we don't know how long it was, when we have a huge going the other way situation, the fall of man in Genesis 3. And we have the entropy moving towards chaos. And we have no idea, we really have no grasp of what the creation was like prior to the third chapter of Genesis. We do know that we now see a cursed creation, a creation under the curse. There is, so that, that's a major change in the world. There's another major change in the world that is probably every bit as catastrophic, and that's the flood of Noah. That was more than just a lot of water. It changed the whole ecology. The whole planet Earth changed dramatically. And so it's from that point that we have this, what we might call, second world. Maybe it's the third or fourth, depending on how you're going to count things. But clearly... The world that we're in is very, very different than the world that Adam and Eve lived in and that the people before Noah's flood lived in. Huge changes. But the point is, those were changes. And they're changes that Peter's readers would understand. And his point is, if God changed it at the fall, if he changed it at the flood of Noah, he can certainly change it. But the next time will not be by water, it'll be by fire. So he's going to get in. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. That's his point.
You want to talk about global warming? Peter's going to talk about global warming here. Okay? Next time by far, you'll find that in Isaiah 66. Daniel talks about it in Daniel 7. Malachi talks about it in, in, in uh, chapter 4. And certain 2 Thessalonians, of course, hammers that. In fact, Colossians 1 verse 17 makes the remark that all things are made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And by him all things are, your King James says, consist. The Greek term implies held together. Jesus Christ, the creator of the world, is holding all things together. But there is a time when he's going to let go. Okay. God's sovereignty over time. Job talks about that. See, God has a perspective and intensity and a priority that we lack. His, his concept of time is very different than ours. In fact, that's, he, he quotes here from Psalm 90 to make that point. Second Peter 3, 8 says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, actually as yesterday. And uh, I think we should resist the temptation to equate a day in the Scripture with specifically a thousand years. A lot of people make their little assumptions from that. That, that I think, is pressing this verse too far. It's not a calculation. It's a metaphor. It means that time is relative. One day with the Lord, uh, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years like yesterday. That's really the flavor of it. And uh, we assume that time is linear and absolute. We all think that, uh, you know, uh, an hour for us is the same as it was an hour for our pioneers in 1600 or something. We think, we think that time is time. It's, it's, it's physical and it's absolute. But we need to realize that, one, again, one of the discoveries of 20th century science is that time is a physical property and it changes. It varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity, among other things. So time is variable. It's a relative measure. And uh, so there are examples in the laboratory of time going backwards. A positron is regarded by some as an ele a electron in a time reversal. And uh, not a big thing for us to be concerned about. Just realize, though, that some of the presumptions we have are just that. They're presumptions. The nature of time. Can, ta can time go backward? If time suddenly was going backward, how would you tell? Because everything, all, all clocks would be going backwards. Everything that you can think about that you'd measure would make it impossible for you to tell whether time's going forward or backward, it turns out. Except there's one thing, if you were suddenly worried about that, there's a very simple way you could tell whether time's going forward or backward. You go get a deck of cards and shuffle them. And as you shuffle them, they become more ordered, you know you're going backwards in time. Because there is an arrow of time, it's called entropy. Things go towards randomness. And uh, so, a Rubik group. You, if you start, you know, it, it's going to get more and more confused unless you're adding some insights. So the entropy laws is, is a way of measuring that. So eternity itself is not having lots of time, but it's being outside <coughs> of our particular time domain altogether. And uh, this whole idea of a seven thousand year week of of history, ancient notion. It first appears in the Epistle of Barnabas. It's exploited by Augustine. Uh, Setterfield, Barry Setterfield, has brought upon his head all kinds of criticism from physicists because he's been arguing for over 20 years the speed of light is not a constant. It's been slowing down. And uh, we embraced some of his writings many years ago and took a lot of abuse from our friends like Hugh Ross and others. Only now in recent years it's, a, it's now recognized that he's right. The speed of light has been slowing down. And it's, it's our conjecture with Barry and others that uh, the uh, entropy laws were initiated in Genesis 3. They're part of the curse. But that's, we draw that, conf that inference from Romans 8, but that's another story. Let's go on here. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And by the way, this is kind of an interesting sentence because it refused Calvinism. Okay? Not willing that any should perish. That refutes Calvinism. It says that Christ died just for those that were saved. No. God is not willing that any should perish. The great tragedy is that after the entire panorama of, of redemption that we study, God doesn't get what He wants. After all the 
pain and suffering, the, the whole program when the smoke clears. God doesn't get what he wants. He didn't get what he wants out of this deal. Why? Because not all will repent. He would prefer all to repent, but he won't violate their sovereignty. And so some will not, some will perish. God's not willing that any should perish. He would prefer all to all repent. But not all will, we know. By the way, time itself is our most inelastic resource. On Wall Street, they used to say, if money is your biggest problem, you're in great shape. Because you can always get more money. There's always another deal. New day, new deal. So that's not, that's not the critical resource. Critical resource is your health and or your time. That's limited. You can't add to that. That's what, what an economist would call an inelastic resource. An elastic resource is one that will respond to price. Oil is elastic, you know. If the price goes up, there's more of it because it makes it more feasible to get it, and so forth. So, butter. If butter's cheap, butter's, it, it, the amount of butter will function what the price of it is, so forth. That's what they mean by the, the uh, supply being elastic. Time is inelastic. You cannot add new time. There's, it is perishable. Nothing's more gone than last, the hour last, you know, or the yesterday. Last week. That's gone. And uh, so, it's, it, that's what they mean by time is inelastic. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, teach us to number our days. Or I put it more precisely, number our nanoseconds, right? But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now, this is a phrase we want to talk about a little bit. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also. And the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Thief in the night. Let's talk about that a minute. That's a term from Paul's epistle. And he says a lot about that. It's amazing to me how many don't understand what he means by that. Let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians 5. Paul writing, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. There is an ellipsis here. To whom is the thief of the night? He'll explain that. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Who will not escape? Those to whom he comes as the thief of the night. He goes on here. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light, and children of the day. Ye are not of the night, nor of darkness. What's his point? He implies, as you understand what he's saying up here, let's go read it again. For, your, you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. To them who are in darkness is his point. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you. See the contrast he's implying here. It's very clear if you just take the whole passage. That they should overtake you. Ye are all children of the light and children of the day. Ye are not of the night or of darkness. He continues here. See, you see the difference. The thief of the night up here is in contrast to those that uh, ye are not of the night or uh, of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet and uh, the hope of salvation. Now, when you digest 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you'll discover something very bizarre. That the believer will not be caught by surprise. Doesn't know the time and the hour, don't misunderstand me. But the believer will, be in a, will not be surprised. He'll be in an expectation. that it, it, it's, He's not caught like a thief in the night, is the point. That's to the unbeliever. That's, the, that's to the unbeliever. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Earth also, the works then, uh, uh, that are therein shall be burned up. The day of the Lord. Now that's a phrase that's all through the Scripture. What is the day of the Lord? In the first chapter of the book of Revelation, there's a verse often misunderstood. Paul says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. 
Does he mean Sunday? No, he doesn't mean Sunday. That's a Western concept. He was in the Spirit on the day of the Lord. Paul, uh, excuse me, John was transported through time and granted this view of the day of the Lord. And uh, the day of the Lord shall come. And it's a thief of the night to those who are in darkness, as we've just seen. And we're going to see that what Paul's, what uh, Peter's going to talk about here, behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. That's what Isaiah 65, 17 talks about. Day of the Lord shall come as a thief of the night, in the which, aha. Uh -huh. uh, now the day of the Lord started long ago. It's actually started. But it's going to include, of course, this whole thing of the seventh week day. In fact, it even includes the millennium. It doesn't finish until we have a new heavens and a new earth. The, the day of the Lord. Closes at the end of the millennium when the destruction of the heavens of the earth in, in Revelation 20 and 21, and I'll add Isaiah 65, take place. Heaven shall pass away with a great noise. Very strange term here. This word noise isn't loud. It's a strange Greek word that is really used for the swish of an arrow or the rush of wings or the splash of water or the hiss of a serpent. It's a noise that arrests our attention, but not because it's loud. It's a very, very subtle term. And the, in which the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Stokia, basic building blocks. And uh, elements uh, is stokia and melt. It actually, the word in the, in the Greek, the luo, means to untie or loose. The elements are unleashed, unloosed. That's why it's interesting to see that Christ is holding them in, all, in, in, in his, uh, he, he holds them in, in, in uh, consistency. No, they're going to be turned loose. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and guidance? The word conversation, of course, is the old English term for what we would call behavior, holy behavior and godliness. Ought ye to be? See, this raises the question, how then shall we live as a result of all? These aren't just intellectual concepts to bandy around over a cup of coffee or something. No, these should be revising our own priorities. How do these realities impact our lives? God does intervene in history, and He is going to do that probably sooner than we realize. Peter continues, For looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, when, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Looking for and hastening unto the coming. Did you know that you can hasten the, the, the day of God? That, that really bothered me when I first realized that. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. Where in the heavens a being on fire shall be dissolved. That's what we pray for, by the way, when you pray the Lord's Prayer. Most people, many Christians, just from habit taught since childhood, they pray the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. What does that mean? It's amazing that uh, probably uh, one church in ten uh, has any idea of, uh, that the millennium is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, that God, that Jesus is actually going to rule uh, the entire world from Israel, uh, and, uh, you know, rule the entire planet Earth. He's going to set up a kingdom for a thousand years. And it's very detailed. Uh, there's an astonishing amount of detail described about it. So uh, you and I can help bring in the fullness that Paul talks about in Romans 11.25. Israel's blinded until the fullness of the Gentile be come in. You should be adding to the fullness of the Gentiles. And uh, you can, for all of this, you can get into our Revelation or the Isaiah commentaries. They deal a great deal with this whole period. Peter and I, Revelation and Isaiah, uh, will tell us more about global warming than uh, any materials promoted by Al Gore. He's got the wrong picture here. Elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Mountains melting. We don't think of that, do we? Psalm 46 does. Micah chapter 1 does. And there are a lot of other passages. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wow. New heavens and new earth. Call this world number three, maybe, Right? First world, whatever it was, we'll take that as changing at Genesis 3 or certainly at, at uh, Genesis 6, you know, Noah's flood. 
We're, the world we now have, call it two or three or whatever, there's a new one coming, totally new. Isaiah 65, 66, Revelation 20 and 21, I'll deal with that. This one, the one that's coming, will have righteousness dwelling in it. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Be diligent. The call for diligence, how this echoes throughout all of Paul's and Peter's epistles. This is the third time Peter has mentioned diligence. He mentioned it twice in the first chapter. How then shall we live? And why? Why should we live any differently? Many Christians are confused about that. I'm saved. I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saved. So, that's a starting gun, not a finish line. Behavior matters. You can't earn your salvation. Jesus paid for that 100%. You've got your entry ticket to heaven. No problem there. But what about your inheritance that he set aside for those that are faithful? You can run the risk of forfeiting that. That's why Paul was so paranoid about his, his ministry. Lest preaching to others, I and myself might be a castaway, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. What's he afraid of? Losing his salvation? Of course not. He wrote the book on eternal security. It's called Romans chapter 8. Why then? How then should we live? We should live without spot, blameless. Why? So that the Lord will have the pleasure of awarding us that inheritance which he set aside for us if we are obedient, if we are perseverant, if we are overcomers. Seven promises of the overcomers in Revelation 2 and 3. You should be familiar with them. And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Now this is a very important little verse here that many people don't understand. And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Okay, fair enough. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Well, wait a minute. To whom is Peter writing? You can establish from the letters that he's writing the Jewish believers. But he says, Paul wrote, uh, according to the wisdom given him, hath written unto you. So if the epistle to Hebrews is not Paul's epistle, there's one missing. Peter here documents that Paul wrote an epistle to the Hebrews. People miss that point. You can actually, I believe, demonstrate quite clearly, would be on a reasonable doubt, that the epistle of Hebrews is Pauline, is Paul's expression. And we do all of that, we beat that to death in our commentary on Hebrews. I encourage you to take a look at it and come to your own conclusions. But Peter goes on here to even make a more astonishing statement. He says, Paul has had written to you. So this authenticates Paul's authorship of Hebrews, I believe. There are no other Paul's writings to the Jews and which corroborates these eschatological truths. And he does that in Hebrews 12. See, in other words, not only has he written the Hebrews, but who ha Paul has written about these things to the Jews. And he has in the epistle of Hebrews, is the point, okay? As also in all his epistles, Peter talking about Paul here, this is interesting, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and I love this little insert, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Wow, Peter is communicating a great deal here. He admits, first of all, also in all his epistles, Peter apparently had access to Paul's epistles. How could that be? Because they were encouraged to copy and exchange. When he wrote to the Colossians, it was supposed to be handed to Laodicean also, and so on. As also in all his epistles, it fascinates me that Peter could make a statement in which he felt he was aware of Paul's writings, all of them. I think that in itself is fascinating. Speaking in them of these things in which some things are hard to be understood. In other words, Peter sort of acknowledges that he's not sure he gets it all. Paul's a pretty tough read, and indeed he is. Many experts have concluded that Paul was probably the, one of the greatest minds that ever walked the planet Earth. We, uh, some things are hard to understand, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures. 
Now, this is a profound statement by Peter because he's putting Paul's writings in the same category as the Old Testament. The term scriptures they used for their scriptures, which, by the way, was the Greek translation of those scriptures called the Septuagint. Three centuries before the Gospel period, the Jewish Old Testament is translated into Greek and because that was what most Jews spoke. It was the commercial language. Many, the, 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 the true Hebrew was uh, really used the same way Catholics use Latin. It was official, but it, many didn't really have comfort with it. So they, that's why they tra- had the entire Jewish scriptures translated into Greek. Three centuries before Christ. And it's the Septuagint. We notice that the quotes in the New Testament from the Old. When someone in the New Testament quotes an Old Testament passage, more often than not, He is quoting from the Greek translation of that. We can tell by the subtle differences. But it's interesting, Peter puts Paul's writings in the same category as he does the Old Testament. Now that has staggering implications. There's there's no basis for us to to, um, demean in any way Paul's writings. They're clearly inspired and are so regarded by the early church. So... Those that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Okay. So, Peter admits that he's tough to understand, but he corroborates Paul's writings in the same category as the scriptures. That's interesting. Moving on. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Wow, that's something we need to be diligent about. We need to realize that we, even though we're saved, can stumble and be led away in, uh, 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 by a lack of steadfastness and, and, in effect, injure our inheritance as a result. Beware lest ye also. No one will ever fail if he keeps his eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Doctrinal error of a serious character is almost invariably connected with some moral failure. Doctrine and morality are linked together. Important to understand. These are not theoretical exercises for theologians. These are practically, uh, very practical links in our own chain. So we need to exercise what's called due diligence. So we need to exercise the diligence to do the subject. If you're an investor or on Wall Street or an executive, you know what exercising due diligence means. We need to do it about the Word of God also. But here's his final admonition to each of us. But grow in grace. Wow, did you know you can grow in grace? I thought grace was a gift. Yes, but you can grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Grow in grace. Are you growing? Are you, uh, are you a Christian that's had one year experience repeated ten times? Or are you a ten-year Christian that's grown ten years worth? In other words, is your spiritual condition today materially better than it was a year ago? Or adding, asking the same question a little differently, Will at the end of this year, will your spiritual condition be substantially improved from where it is today? And my my premise is that it will only if you make an effort to have it so. That that doesn't just happen. It comes from a result of planting the right seeds. And so... Let's talk a little bit about grace. Grace is the method of divine dealing in salvation and the believer's life and service. As saved, you're not under the law, but under grace, Romans tells us in Romans 6.14. God ceaselessly works through grace to impart and perfect in Him corresponding graces. And we have plenty of scriptures on that. Grace, therefore, stands connected with service, and there's dozens of passages on that that you can look at at your leisure. It also stands connected with Christian growth, because you grow in grace, and there's all kinds of passages there. And it also gets involved with giving. As you give, you gain more grace. And so those are all concepts that you can dig out from the, dig from the notes and formulate your own study of grace. 
probably one of the most important studies you'll make in the New Testament. So how do you, with this whole passage has to do with apostasy, how do you prepare against apostasy? Well, one thing you need to do to prepare is to improve your knowledge of the Word of God. And I don't think that just happens. If you're going to grow in your spiritual walk, it's going to include, not limited to, but going to include a systematic study of the Scriptures, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. And when you've gone through the whole Bible, you go through it again. The more you go through it, the more you'll gain from each passage passing through. So I encourage you to adopt some systematic approach to the Word of God. Relying on a Sunday morning sermon for that is obviously inadequate. You need to have a systematic study. And, and one of the most fruitful in my 60 years as a Christian, the place I've seen people grow, is in small groups. Groups that are small enough that you can ask questions without embarrassment, small enough that you hold each other accountable in a certain sense, but in the, not just meeting together, but studying the Word of God. Typically weekly, during the week sometime, a uh, businessman in, the, in a breakfast meeting before the, the day starts, or more, more commonly in a neighborhood Bible study in the evening, but during the week. Celebrate your Christianity on your day of worship with your fellowship. Don't, don't abandon the gathering together of, the, of the, the total body. That's very important. But don't rely on just that for your own personal growth. That's also one of the reasons we have organized this uh, think tank we call Coin the Institute on the Internet. So you can do that systematically and yet on your own clock. You don't have to be at a appointed time at a particular place. You can do it whenever you want during the week, but you connect with your people by text messaging and you discuss these things and you answer, uh, inform answer questions about the information you have. It's, a, it's an interactive growth experience. That you, it's volunteer, you can do it whenever you like. But undertake a systematic study of the Word of God. And that should be directed not to intellectual sense of things. It should be directed towards a personal knowledge of, of Jesus Christ Himself. That's what it's all about. Not, it's not about what group you belong to. It's not how many Bible verses you've memorized. It's do you know Him? Do you personally experience Him every day? That's what it's all about. Well, that concludes our review of this interesting couple of letters from our Galilean fishermen. It's fascinating to contrast this uh, bumbling... Galilean fishermen, uneducated, who always seem to be saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. And yet, after he gains the Holy Spirit, has these incredibly gifted sermons in Acts chapter 2, and his second sermon in Acts chapter 3, and then these cra incredibly crafted letters from our friend Peter. I don't know about you, but I'm really looking forward to meeting him. He's going to be one of probably one of the most colorful characters up there. And it should be a delightful time. When, and when you meet him, you'll say, hey, I read your book. You know? <laughs> so let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this wonderful, this colorful friend, Peter. We thank you, Father, for his stumblings as well as his successes. We thank you, Father, for his words that you've inspired we thank you, Father, for this incredible, very human friend. We thank you, Father, for the gift of your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. But above all, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you've gone to such extremes that we might live. We thank you, Father, that you have a destiny for us that will transcend the coming conflagration that is destined upon the planet Earth. We just thank you, Father, and look forward to what you have for us. Help us each to grow in grace in the knowledge of our coming King, that we might be more effective stewards of the opportunities before us, that we might be more, might be more pleasing in your sight as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservations whatsoever. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen.